Meditation song this morning will be on the screen only. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Well, good morning again. Welcome to the Beltline Church of Christ. Again, if you're visiting with us, we are so thankful that you're here. Hope that you have been well received and hope that you will stick around a little bit afterwards so that we can get to visit with you just a little bit. And I uh, pray that if you're looking for a church home, you don't have to look any further than right here, right now. We are so blessed to have you here and excited about uh, what God is doing in our midst. I want to kind of follow up last week's lesson with another one. Last week, if you remember, we talked about the fear of men and how the fear of men can handcuff us and it can keep us from being who God really wants us to be and it can keep us from getting that, that, that plan that God has for our lives. Well, there are thousands of fears, there are thousands of phobias that people have in their lives. From the fear of the number 13 to the fear of heights to the fear of falling to the fear of whatever you want to talk about, fear is all too common. And one of the things I want to talk about today is the fear of failure. You see, like the fear of men, the fear of failure is one of those things that just absolutely wrecks us sometimes. It keeps us from doing and being who God wants us to be. And my question that I have for you as we get started is, do you have a place where it is safe for you to fail? Do you have a place where it is safe for you to fail? The title of the lesson this morning is Fail Safe. Because there are not many places in the world like that where it's safe to fail. There are not many places where you can fail without serious, serious consequences. But I heard a story not too long ago about a man who got to do that, and I'll share it with you as we get started. This is from Reader's Digest, and it says a man went into the store, and he was only in there for about five minutes. And when he came out, there was a police officer writing a parking ticket. And he did what most of us would do. He went up to him and he said, how about giving a guy a break? And the officer basically ignored him and continued writing the ticket. And so the guy got pretty mad and he called him a pencil-pushing Nazi. <laughs> well, the officer glared at him and began writing a second ticket for having worn tires. And so the guy called him a piece of dirt. Well, the officer finished writing the second ticket, and he placed it under the windshield with the first one when the guy decided it was time to change tactics. He began pleading with him to give him a break. He said, I was only in there to get medicine for my sick mother-in-law. <laughs> that was a good one, too. So the, officer began, so the officer began writing a third ticket. He said this went on for 20 minutes, and the more the man pleaded, the more tickets the officer wrote. wrote. And finally, the cop got on his motorcycle sickle and drove off, and the man walked around the corner where he was parked and got in his car and drove away. <laughs> you see, there's not many places in the world where it is safe for us to fail, where there's not great consequences for the failures that we have. So where can you go to fail safely or to fail safe? Where can you go? Let me ask you, is school a place, guys, where you can fail safely? I don't think so. Not only are your parents going to get after you about that, but, but we know that, that school can be tough. And most of us found out pretty early in life that if you fail, you're going to get branded pretty easily, not only by your teachers, but by your peers and everybody else around you. So school really isn't a place where it's safe for us to fail. Well, how about work, those of you who are in the workforce? <laughs> Is it safe for you to fail there? Not if you want to keep your job, right? I don't know many jobs that reward failure. They may get, get, you may get by with one, but you do any more than that, you're done. You're finished, and you're going to be looking for something else. How about in the arena of sports? Is it safe to fail in the arena of sports? Not if you want to stay in that arena. It's not. I mean, think about all over this country how many coaches have won more games than they've lost, but they've been fired because they couldn't win the big game, right? It's not safe to fail there either. How about this one? How about church? Is it safe to fail at church? Well, it should be a place where we can all fail safely. It ought to be a place where failures can feel safe. But sadly, some of you sitting here today are bearing the wounds and scars of how you were treated by a church family when you failed. Can I get a weary something from you on that? Church ought to be a place where that happens, but that's not always the case. And what happens is we become afraid to fail. And the fear of failure becomes one of Satan's most effective strategies in dealing with you and me. 
You can't do that. You're just going to fail. Or maybe you've heard this one before. We tried that before. It didn't work. We're not going to try it again. Because the fear of failure stops us from doing the things that God wants us to be about far too often. There's a great story that you're familiar with, the parable of the talents from Matthew chapter 25. You know the story well. It begins in verse 14. And if you remember the story, three men are given the opportunity of a lifetime. A very generous and a very wealthy man decides to give three of his servants the opportunity of a lifetime. Understand that a talent was more than a year's wages. And so these three guys have been singled out to have this amazing opportunity. To one, the the, the landowner gives five talents, five years worth of wages, and he says, I want you to go do something with it. Another guy gets two, and a third guy gets one, and we know what happens. The guy with five talents, I don't know, he begins to buy and sell and trade and do business, and he creates five more to ultimately have ten talents. And his master says, wow, well done, good and faithful servant. And the guy with two, maybe taking his lead from the guy with five, does the same thing. And, and he doubles his profits as well. And he has four talents. And, and the landowner says, well done, good and faithful servant. And then there's that one talent guy. That one talent guy goes and he, he, he is so afraid to fail that he simply buries that money in the ground. I don't want to lose it. <laughs> I'm afraid that, 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 that if I do, that the landowner will be mad at me, and, 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 I, and I, just, I just can't do anything. And so he buries it, and he thinks that simply giving back the landowner, the money that he's been given, will be enough. <laughs> but if you know the story, you know in, in Matthew 25, verse 26, Jesus calls him a wicked and a lazy servant. Let me ask you. Have you ever let the fear of what might go wrong intimidate you so that you were unable to do what was right? Come on, let's be honest with each other this morning. We're family, aren't we? How many of us have done just that? Let the fear of what might go wrong keep us from doing anything at all. Many times I know I've been in situations where I knew God was telling me to do something, something that I believed was right and good, and I left it undone for fear that I might fail if I tried. Oh, you know what we call that? We call that playing it safe. The question is, does God call us to play it safe? I don't believe that he does. And really, we're just deceiving ourselves because we think we're playing it safe, but avoiding risky obedience only produces the illusion of security. It's not real. You're not really playing it safe by doing nothing. What you're really doing is producing stagnation in your life. What you're really doing is missing opportunities for God to grow you up in the faith. That's what happens when we are afraid to try something and we let the fear of failure keep us from doing things. Whether that's at church or in a marriage or in your personal development, when we allow the fear of failure to stop us, we get ourselves in a lot of trouble. So we need a place where it's safe for us to fail. And can I, suggest it, can I suggest to you this morning that the only place that we're really going to find that is at the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the only place where it has become safe for us to fail. And we came to the cross. Here's the thing. We came once to the cross knowing that we didn't have it all together, knowing that we were failures, but sometimes you and I forget the place where we start. And so, one thing that we need to do in order to deal with with our fear of failure is to re-emphasize something. And what we need to re-emphasize is that admitting failure is the first step to submitting to Christ. You will never give your life to Jesus. You will never submit to Jesus. You will never do the things that Jesus wants you to do if you are too busy trying to protect your reputation or or, or you're too busy to to admit that you're a failure and that that failure is a part of life. And so we need to reemphasize and admit that failure is the first step. Admitting failure is the first step to submitting to Christ. Because let me just be honest with you. All of us were examined at the cross, and guess what? We all failed. Every single one of us. Every last one of us. I mean, that's the reason there was a cross in the first place, wasn't there? Because we are all moral failures. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is that our entrance into his kingdom was not based on our claim to be mistake-free. 
our entrance into his kingdom was based on our desire to be guilt-free. In Colossians chapter 2, there's this amazing section of scripture that I love. Verse 13 says this, it says, You who were dead in your failures, your trespasses, You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made alive together with you, with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it, where? To his cross, because the cross is the only place that you and I ever have an opportunity to fail safe. And the beautiful thing is, the only perfection that God expects doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. You see, God knows that you have failed, and he is not surprised when we continue to fail him. Psalm 103, 14, there's this amazing little little verse that's kind of tucked in there that we don't look at very much, but, but it says this, Psalm 103, 14, it says he knows our frame. He knows us, and he remembers that we are but dust. He knows us, He remembers what we are. God knows that we are weak, and submitting to him begins by admitting that we are, in fact, weak. In fact, can I be honest with you this morning and tell you that to fail to admit that you have failed is the ultimate failure in the eyes of God. Let me say that again. Failing to admit that you have failed is the ultimate failure in the eyes of God. If you have your Bibles, let's go together to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we have the story of this sinful woman and a Pharisee named Simon. And we're going to talk a whole lot more about this story in a future lesson because there is just so much good stuff wrapped up right here in this text. But let's just read a few verses beginning with verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees, it says, asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of that city who was a sinner, and I I love how the scripture does that. I mean, he could be describing every one of us and everyone in that city who was a sinner. I love that. When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, this is my best Simon voice, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she She is a sinner. It's interesting to me, this story. You see, on the surface, Simon looks like the success. On the surface, Simon looks like the guy who has it all together. On the surface, Simon is the one we would all want to be like. But when you read the end of the story, you see that it's Jesus who declares him the failure, and he lifts up this so-called sinner. Amazing the way God views failures and the way we view failures. In Luke 18, we have this story of uh, of a Pharisee and a tax collector coming to pray. Do you remember? The tax collector, or excuse me, the Pharisee comes in and he says, God, you are lucky to have me on your team. I give a tithe of everything that I possess. I am a really good guy. I'm not like that loser over there who works for the wrong team and doesn't do the right things. You're just blessed that I'm here for you, Lord. And the other guy can't even lift his eyes up in the heaven, but says, be merciful to me, a sinner. Who was the failure in the eyes of God? The one that had it all together? No. The one who admitted that he was a failure. The message of the gospel, I want you to hear this today. The message of the gospel is not that we should never fail. The message of the gospel is that his grace will never fail to be greater than our weaknesses. That's the message of the gospel. Grace has made it safe for us to fail. And if that's true, then I want to teach you three lessons today. Three lessons we all need to learn about failure. Here's number one. First lesson we need to learn about failure. Our failures are not fatal. Our failures are not fatal fatal. And you need to know that because you have failed and you will fail again and I will be included in your company. (laughs) 
Let's just throw it out there right now. And failure is going to cause some people, maybe even some people sitting in this audience, I hope not, but it's going to cause some people to be done with you. It's going to cause some people to walk away from you. But it will never, hear this, your failures will never end God's purpose for you. God loves failures. If he didn't, why did he make so many of us? He loves failures. If you think back to Hebrews chapter 11, we talked about this in our Bible study this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, we have this hall of fame of faith, remember? I mean, some of the most bulwarks of the faith are mentioned there, from Abraham all the way on down. But let's talk about Abraham a little bit. How many times did he lie about his wife? How many times? Twice, right? At least. And then his son followed right in his footsteps. It even mentions Jacob in this hall of fame of faith. Do you know what a wreck Jacob's life was? I mean, this guy was an absolute crook and a deceiver. But yet here he is mentioned in the hall of fame of faith. And then there's Moses and Samson. Really, Samson. I mean, that guy's just a, one, one brick short of something. I, he's just not right. The things that he does with Delilah, I don't understand it. Hey, what, what, what do you need to take your strength away? Well, if you do the And then she does it. And he, anyway, I'm, I'm going off on that. <laughs> Samson, and, and, and what about David? You see, each one of these people listed in this hall of fame of faith, I can take you to a place in the Bible where they not only failed, but they colossally failed. Yet God puts them in these chapters of the Hall of Fame of Heroes of Faith. You see, God does not terminate his relationship to those who fail. You see, I want to tell you something about God this morning. Some of you have this impression of God that he stands up with that proverbial flower and he says, oh, I love him. Oh, he messed up. I love him not. Oh, he's back on track. Okay, I love him. Oh, he messed up again. That's not our God. That is not what he does. That is nowhere close to the God of the Bible. You see, when we are running this race that's set before us, this race that we call life, that that so often really is a rat race, and we fall down and we mess up, God doesn't yell down, hey, what's wrong with you? God doesn't say, what in the world were you thinking? How could you have done that same sin again and again? That's not what God does. That is not the God of the Bible. Our God is cheering us on. Our God is calling us to get back up. Our God is calling us to get back in the race. Those of you who are parents, when your kids are playing a sport or something like that and something goes wrong, do you scream at them from the stands, Hey, come on, get it together. Maybe some of you do. I, I hope that's not... Good parents who are out there, is that, is that what you do with your kids? No. You recognize that when your kids are struggling, that what they need is encouragement, not discouragement. You recognize that what they need is someone in their corner, someone saying, you can do it, get back up, get back into it, you can do it again. You encourage them to keep going. Our failures, guys, are not fatal in the eyes of God. And the perfect example of this comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verse 1. I love this verse, and it's one we'll spend zero time with when we study this Bible, but here's what it says. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Oh, don't you love it? What an amazing verse. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This is what God does with failures. Jonah is called by God to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel, but he hates the Ninevites, and so he says, I'm not going to do that, and he goes running off in the opposite direction. God allows him to be swallowed by a giant fish, and we think that the book's all about a giant fish. It has nothing to do with a giant fish, by the way. He spit out on dry ground, and then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I love it. God called Jonah a second time. This is what God does when we fail. He calls us back into his purposes. He calls us back into the fight. If God only used perfect people, what would ever, ever get done? Grace goes beyond our weaknesses. And the clearest picture of this in the New Testament comes from the Apostle Peter. Did anyone fail Jesus as blatantly and as publicly as the Apostle Peter did? But even when the courage of Peter failed Jesus, 
Jesus' love never failed Peter. In John chapter 21, we have that story of after the resurrection, Jesus is cooking breakfast and he calls Peter and Peter dives into the water and he swims to the shore and they eat breakfast and then Jesus and Peter have this time together. They're walking and, and, and do you remember what Jesus asked him? Simon, he doesn't call him Peter because he's not acting much like the rock anymore. He calls him Simon, son of Jonah. Do you love me more than these? Do you understand that's the question that he asked? The question wasn't, Peter, why did you fail me when you said that you wouldn't? That wasn't the question that God asked Peter, was it? It wasn't, Peter, you, you said that you would die for me, and you didn't. What's wrong with you? That's not the question that Jesus asked Peter. What was the question? Do you love me? And can I suggest to you that that was the only question that mattered then? It may be the only question that matters now. Do you really love God? And if you love Jesus and you are willing to give your life to him and submit your life to him, then failure doesn't get to have the last word in your life. And you need to hear that, and so do I. Failure doesn't get to have the last word. Your failures are not fatal. Number two, your failures are not futile. Your failures are not futile either. God does not only forgive failure, he transforms it. And this is one of the wonderful things about God. Has God, let me ask you this question, has God ever used a failure of yours to grant you a new measure of wisdom? I hope that he has, because if he hasn't, then you are not learning from your mistakes. And if you're not learning from your mistakes, you're doomed to repeat the same things over and over and over again. You see, I believe that God uses our failures to refine us. In fact, the, pro the proverb writer says in ver chapter 15, verse 31, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 31, he says this. He says, the ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof, learns from his mistakes, gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. God uses our failures to grant us new measures of wisdom, but I think it goes even further than that as well. I believe that God does not just grant us wisdom when we fail, but that God can actually use my failures to promote the success of his kingdom. And don't you know, this has got to drive the enemy crazy. Not only does God use my strengths, but God can even use my failures and my weaknesses to be about his business. Wow. That's the kind of God that you and I serve. He, he, he can use it all. Our failures can be like a sacrifice bunt in baseball. Since opening day was yesterday, and some of you have the rednecks to show for it, let me just use a little baseball illustration. That redneck joke was not intended for anything else other than, than sunburn necks. Anyway, the, the sacrifice bunt in baseball. You have a runner on first or second or sometimes even third base, and, and you have a guy that gets up to bat, and his job is to hit this little nothing thing so that he's going to get thrown out at first base. He's going to be out. He's going to fail to get on base. But what happens is in hitting that little bunt, he has now moved a, a runner into scoring position. That's what God does with our failures. He uses our failures to promote the success and to advance his kingdom. Let me give you an example. Paul and Barnabas, before they head out on the second missionary journey, do you remember this? They get in this heated argument over John Mark. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, says, we're going to bring him along. And Paul says, he left us. He failed us. We don't want him along this time. No, we want him. No, we don't. No, we want him. No, we don't. They go back and forth. Scripture says that the, the, the argument becomes so heated that they decide to part company. Barnabas takes John Mark. Paul takes a guy named Silas. Now, I don't believe it was the will of God that two of his best men sever ties. But God allows that failure to create two mission teams. And two mission teams then go into all the world and preach the gospel. God did not allow their failure to negatively impact his purpose. And he won't let yours either. Could it be also, let me just throw this in for free. Couldn't it be also that God allows us to fail because we may be heading down a wrong path? He allows us to fail because we're moving in a wrong direction. Could it be that God does that for us? 
You see, your failures may mean a detour, but your failures, if you're a follower of Jesus in love with him and willing to do what he says, are not the end of the road. Our failures are not fatal. Our failures are not futile. And number three, our failures are not final. Our failures are not final. God is going to love you with an unfailing love no matter how many times you fail. Now, please don't misunderstand. God doesn't want you to fail. He doesn't want us to be in sin. He doesn't want us that way. And I'm certainly not saying that, that once you're saved, you're always saved, and there's nothing. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is this. God distinguishes between your failure and your worth. God knows the difference between your failure and your worth. You see, the great tragedy then is not to try and fail. The great tragedy is not to mess up. The great tragedy is to fail to keep on trying. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For the righteous falls seven times and rises again. You see, I believe that's the difference between the righteous and the wicked here in Proverbs. They fall seven times, but they rise again. He goes on to say, But the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Michael Jordan is probably, in my opinion, and I'm sure we could have some discussion around this, and you'd be wrong, is probably the greatest basketball player in the history of basketball players. Amen? Anyone? Some of my greatest memories when I was growing up and really getting into basketball were of Michael Jordan hitting last-second shots over Craig Elo. Shot on Elo. I mean, the guy was eight feet up in the air when he shot. The, it was amazing. I mean, just incredible. Some of my fa- fondest basketball memories are of dunks that he I'm an amazing player. But did you know that Michael Jordan missed more than 9,000 shots in his career? And did you know that on 26, more than that, because this doesn't count his time with the Wizards, which, whew, <laughs> uh, 26 times he had an opportunity to win the game on the final shot, and he missed. You know who I'd want taking the last shot if I could create a team? Michael Jordan. You see, God will allow us to stay in the game. His love never fails. Now, I need you to hear this. So before you start putting stuff away, I need you to hear this. I I really want you to get this today. This is so important. I want you to remember everything I just said about failures. They're not fatal. They're not futile. They're not final. And, and, and I don't want you to look at other people in this auditorium or out in the world. I don't want you to label them by their failures anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do not look at other people the way God refuses to look at you. I think it's important for us to say that. Don't label another human being by a past failure. And sadly, many of you today are doing just that. You're doing it to yourself. You are doing it to yourself. You are letting the evil one deceive you into only focusing on the failures of your life. But I want want you to hear me say loud and clear that because of the cross, we can fail safe. And God is always ready to take me and you in your failure and help us get back up and draw us closer to him. That's what we call amazing grace and love. And only God offers that. You see, I don't care how the world tries to label you. You may be weak, but you are not a failure. Failure is what you did. It is not who you are. And if you know Jesus Christ and you have have given your life to him, then I want you to hear today that you are a beloved and you are a victorious child of God. And that's the destiny I want you to claim. That's the, the label that I want you to wear. The beloved and victorious child of God. Not the one who's failed. Not the one who's messed up. Not the one who's gonna mess up again. Instead, claim your name as God's child. That's what I want you to leave here today taking, that my failures don't get to have the last word. Instead, my relationship with Jesus Christ does. And if you're here today and you are not in that relationship, then you're still wallowing in your failures. Get out of that. There is no reason for you to spend one more second dwelling on the failures of your life. 
you can have those removed today. You can have those taken away at this very moment. If you're a Christian, come, confess that. Get rid of that sin and get back in the fight. I'm going to be here to encourage you, to, 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 to hold you up and to, to cheer you on, just like God is. And if you've never started this walk with Christ, then don't let those failures define you anymore. Come to the waters of baptism. Get those sins removed and let's watch God do amazing new faith-building things in your life. It's in your court, guys. The ball is in your court. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to leave today the same or are you going to leave transformed by the power of God? The question's yours to answer. If we can help you, if we can pray for you, if we can do anything, why don't you come right now while together we stand and sing this song for your encouragement. Wonderful, merciful, save.